All right, welcome back. Uh, video two of three for the new 2022 contract. We're going to uh, go over section three, the dates and deadlines, and then get into section four, where you type in uh, your price and terms, and then we'll finish out the contract through video three there. So let's get started. So up at the top, section three, date number one, uh, time of day deadline. So this is new to our contract and what you would put in here, or you can leave it blank. So Again, if you leave it blank, it will the contract will default to 11.59 p.m. for that particular day of the deadline. So this is brand new to us. If you have any questions, please call your coaches. You'll notice in the dates and deadlines section, um, all of the dates and deadlines has a section to reference. Um, so day of, uh, day of time deadline references section three. So we're in section three. Here's your deadline. And then you would scroll down past this because this is all still section three. And then this is your uh, basically your your day of deadlines uh, type of thing right here. So this is where it says that um, if you don't put in any time um, that's different or leave that section blank, you're going to end all your deadlines at 1159 p.m. So completely up to you and how you want to run your business. Um, I personally am going to probably end up leaving it at 11.59 p.m. or on some contracts, depending upon what's going on and who I'm working with, I may have an 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. deadline. All up to you guys. Uh, you want to mastermind with us coaches about it, please do so. Uh, date number two, this is um, absolutely filled out almost, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of all contracts, alternative earnings money deadline. Um, what I commonly use here is I put in three business days. So MEC stands for mutual execution of contract. So the reason why I put in uh, three business days after MEC here is just mainly because of my past experience. Um, I used to put in one or two days uh, uh, kind of after I was filling it out. So what I would do is I'd put in an actual date. And what, what came to happen was sometimes negotiations take longer than expected. And sometimes the contract just isn't executed at the time that you think it may be. And sometimes it's executed kind of either on the same day that you need to submit earnest money or even sometimes past and it's overlooked. So it's just something that I do. You can feel free to put in an actual date or um, use one of my tactics here, three business days after MEC. And moving right along to title. Um, so your title record deadline, please talk to your title company. Most title companies will actually have a, a cheat sheet for dates and deadlines. But if you can kind of remember, just kind of the rule of thumb is this title takes about a week to do their job to get us their preliminary title commitment. And so as far as um, the title deadlines and tax certificate deadlines go, what I put on there is about seven days out. So if it's Friday today, I put Friday of next week, uh, give yourself a few days to review that and look over it. Um, two to three days should be okay with your buyer, depending upon their travel schedule, work schedule. Just make sure you communicate with everyone around that. Um, so if I put that on a Friday, the 28th, I'm probably going to be looking at having some sort of objection on Tuesday, the 1st. Um, and then same thing with off record. So I just kind of mirror match the record title, deadline and objection. So 28th here, as well as the first the reason why I do that is because, you know, I try not to have too many dates and deadlines on all these sporadic days. You'll, you'll learn that throughout uh, this real estate world, having many contracts, many things in play, um, having some of the dates that can be on the same deadline day are beneficial for you, your mind, your sanity. And so uh, that's kind of my pro tip for you. Put these both on the same days and then your resolution um, sometime after that. So we have our objection on the first. And so that we need the time for the sellers to maybe um, figure out how they're going to resolve our objection. So I'll put it two days out. And then if that needs to be amended, if, if title needs more time, the seller needs more time, hopefully your buyer will be uh, willing to extend to resolve this. Uh, third party right to purchase and approve. If you if you're going to be using this, please reach out to your coaches for the sake of this video. And I would say 95% of all my contracts never, ever have had this date and deadline in there. So uh, leave it blank. Or if you do feel like it's applicable for yours, reach out to your coach or a managing broker to fill out properly. Association deadlines or association uh, owner's association. Uh, 
you want to look at this and, and think homeowners association. I know it doesn't say homeowners association. It doesn't say HOA. Um, and so that can kind of trip us up a little bit sometimes, but this is for the HOA documents deadline and termination. So what the seller will be doing is delivering the, the HOA docs to you and the buyer. Um, in reference to section seven, it lists pretty much everything that we need to send over to you. Because you could be working with an HOA that uh, may not be very communicative or attentive, um, you need to understand that the HOA really does not have any obligations to abide by our dates and deadlines. And so to give ample time, I, I personally recommend anywhere between 10 and 14 uh, days. Sometimes you get it sooner. Sometimes you'll need to um, actually have it uh, uh, be extended. Now, the new contracts, you, you do not have to manually extend this date. What it says, and, I, and I'll reference this down in section seven on video three, but what it says is that if the documents are delivered after the association's documents deadline, that's okay, but the buyer has then the right to review those documents for up to 10 days, regardless of what these deadlines say. So let me repeat that again. If the seller, let's say in this situation, we ask for the, uh, the documents by the 4th of February, if the seller can't deliver these documents by the 4th of February, that's okay. You don't have to amend the contract. You can if you'd like. But the way the default contract says is that if they deliver it after the 4th, then buyer, no matter what this date over here is to terminate, buyer would have 10 days after the date that it's delivered to review and terminate if they wish. So it's in the seller's best interest to get it over to us as soon as possible. But again, sometimes it's out of the seller's control. and. Um, the HOAs can be slow sometimes. Um, so once you have that uh, documents, this is a larger packet. There are some buyers that will want to run through all of those documents, very wordy, very lengthy. So give yourself some time. Um, I think from Friday to Tuesday, I think would be enough time. But again, talk to your buyers, be communicative uh, with all parties. Seller disclosure. So seller's property disclosure, you know, that should be filled out, honestly, um, right as uh, the time that the home was, is, is listed and then updated if anything happens. So the seller should really have this already done and executed for you once you go under contract. So um, it's very common to see anywhere between three to seven business days. Um, I'm typically a more of a week type of guy. Like I said, I want um, a lot of the dates to kind of fall on the same deadline. So that way I don't have to put so much stress on myself throughout the week wondering what's due, what's not, and all of that. So we'll continue to roll with Friday here. And same thing with same thing with, with uh, lead-based paint disclosure. That should be, you know, very, uh, very apparent. If the home is built before 1978, seller really should have that executed before they list the property. So should be no problem getting that over to your buyers. Again, uh, anywhere between three and seven business days or I should say three and seven days. Um, I'm gonna use the seven day mark or the next Friday. Loaning credit. So again, very new contract for us. Um, for all of you that have uh, seen it before, we only used to have two loan deadlines and now we have this third one. So we have our, our, our new loan application deadline. That one hasn't changed. Uh, typically what I do is I put either, I will type in, here. Sometimes I do this. It depends on the agent on the other end. Um, there are a lot of agents out there that still don't completely understand that your loan application um, is pretty much 98% filled out uh, with the buyer and the lender before you go under contract, but the lender can't actually complete the application until they have a uh, property address and price. And you get that through executing a contract. So, um, the technical way to do this is to probably put one day. That would give this lender enough time to process the contract and get that uh, application done. New loan terms deadline. So this deadline is brand new to us. And um, this really should be done within the net, within the first, I think, seven to 10 business days. This, this gives the lender and the buyer enough time to process from going under contract to solidifying all of the loan terms and um, basically committing to that. And so most sellers, especially in the seller's market, would 
really appreciate this loan termination deadline to happen pretty quickly. So that way the uh, buyer can't back out due to any bogus reason to just try and uh, back out of the contract due to saying they can't qualify for the loan. So locking in your loan terms within the first seven to 10 business days is recommended. And so we'll go ahead and put that out uh, again on that Friday, about seven days out. New loan availability deadline. So what this deadline really is, is once you lock in your loan, um, you lock in your uh, your terms, then you're going to go throughout the process. You're going to go through the process. You're going to go um, through your inspection, your appraisal, and all of that. And it's long, you know, the loan terms can't change really um, as long as you lock them in with the lender. And so I usually put this deadline about three business days uh, before closing. And the reason why this is here is because there are situations that arise. Sometimes your, your, your buyer will be perfectly fine with the loan terms, but maybe something comes up in life, um, a sick family member, a car accident, um, something in which they might have to use their down payment for. And now they don't have the ability to qualify or grab the loan. Um, and so this deadline here protects the buyer um, pretty much right up until closing. And like I said, I put that deadline for about three days before closing. So if we're looking at a 30 to 35 day contract for this property here, we're going to go ahead and look at maybe um, close to the last week of February. So um, maybe we'll do this guy on the 18th and then maybe close on the 22nd or 23rd of the month. Uh, buyer's credit, disapproval. Existing loan, existing loan, loan transfer, and sell it private transfer. For the sake of this video, kind of like water rights, 95% um, of all contracts, this stuff is left blank unless you run into a special situation. So if you guys ever run into a seller carry or assuming an existing loan, something of that nature, please reach out to your coaches or managing broker to fill it out. Um, but for the most part, many, many, many contracts have all of these guys blank here. And skip right down to appraisal, your appraisal deadline. Uh, this is the deadline for the appraisal to happen, like the site visit and everything to kind of happen and get that appraisal uh, report back. Appraisal reports are pretty lengthy, okay? Um, there's really going to be no objection to an appraisal if it appraises at, that, or at contract price or above. But if it appraises for less than, sometimes the buyer is going to need some time to kind of go through that appraisal and really figure out why it appraised for less. Um, so again, deadline for the appraisal and packet to come back to the buyer. And then maybe a few days after that for the buyer to review and object. And then a few days after that for buyer and seller to negotiate. Um, the most you know, most common negotiations on our appraisal are for price, but there is something else that um, us agents kind of forget over time if we don't run into it. Sometimes you're going to have an appraisal where it comes in at value with what's called conditions. Sometimes there's this, the condition of the home is not necessarily acceptable to the appraiser, um, meaning uh, and you most commonly will see this on a VA or FHA loan. Sometimes if there's a missing shingle or some chipping paint or missing flooring, um, the, the, the appraiser could say, hey, the, the value is, is here. However, we're going to give this, this value as long as these things are taken care of. And so sometimes there's conditional approval. So again, a couple of days after your objection for the buyer and seller to negotiate. So for the sake of this video, I want the appraisal to be done. Um, commonly right now, we're looking at probably two to three weeks for the appraisal to be completed. I typically err on the side of caution with appraisal deadlines and, and try to look at that you know, two and a half to three week mark instead of pushing the appraiser to get it done within the first two weeks. So we've got one week here, two weeks. So let's call it uh, maybe the 10th for the deadline. And then let's go into that Monday for the objection. And then again, a couple of days after the objection, if there's an objection, uh, and we'll push that out till the 16th. Moving right along to survey. Um, so a survey or an ILC, a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, there's a lot of um, different opinions out there of, you know, should you put this in the contract every single time? Should you leave it out and wait for the title company or lender to require it? Um, should you only put in the survey or ILC deadline if you're doing a uh, lot and block ranch um, or farm property, if you will, with a big acreage? I really think that you need to you need to 
think about who you're working with, think about who the other side is and, um, you know, discuss this with your buyer. You see, leaving this blank um, means that both parties are okay with not having it. But what happens if the title company or lender require an ILC or survey and this is left blank? So I've got some provisions. We'll go over it in section three, or I'm sorry, video three. Um, and I'll show you kind of how I do that. So I commonly will leave the survey and ILC deadlines blank. And then I will add a little note into the additional provisions or in section nine, I think uh, both uh, options are perfectly acceptable. And uh, what it says is that should the lender require an ILC or survey, buyer to order and pay. I have the buyer order and pay when it's the lender because the lender because the buyer is the one hiring the lender. And then the other line that I use is should the title company require an ILC or survey, seller to order and pay because commonly the seller is the one choosing the title company. And so both, both parties have some earnest on it if one or the other requires and thus leaving the dates and deadlines out to show the seller, look, I'm not, I'm not committing you to it and I'm not committing myself to it to, to delay anything. Any questions on survey, please reach out. It's one of the trickier ones, kind of the nuanced ones that you, you may be unaware of, especially when you're first starting in this career. Um, surveys commonly take anywhere, um, just like an appraisal, um, two to three weeks. Um, usually I, I err on the side of caution with appraiser, or I'm sorry, um, uh, surveyors. I would say about the three, three and a half week mark um, for the delivery. And then if the buyer needs to object to anything and then resolution a few days after. These are new to 2022. Water rights examination deadline, mineral rights examination deadline. Um, for the sake of this video, if you guys run into anything with mineral or water rights, uh, please reach out to our managing broker or your coaches. These, these deadlines, you know, a lot of it is going to be an attorney review. And sometimes attorneys take a little while to be able to review some documents for you. And they may be lengthy documents. So rule of thumb with those, if you do have to use them, is probably two to three weeks out uh, for attorney review. Sometimes the buyer will be able to review it in a few days. It uh, depends on their level of uh, expertise in that, in that arena. But we are gonna fill out the inspection termination objection and resolution deadlines. So these deadlines here are what you're gonna put on most, most every contract in this seller's market that we're in right now. So it is January of 2022. We are still in a very, very hot, tight seller's market. You are seeing a lot of agents that will only put in an inspection termination deadline. By putting in just the inspection termination deadline and leaving out the objection and resolution, what you're telling the seller is, is this is very similar to a pass or fail inspection, okay? So by just putting in the termination deadline and no objection and resolution deadline, you still have the right to inspect the property. Uh, but what you're saying to the seller is, is that we don't really have any right to object to anything. We're gonna take the house as is, or we're gonna terminate if the buyer feels like there's too many things that are wrong with the property. So very common in our market right now to only see the inspection termination deadline. But the key for you guys in the sake of this video is you need to, you need to talk to your buyer about it, right? You want to make sure that your buyer has the rights in this contract that they want. So you need to be able to talk around why or why not putting in the objection and resolution deadline may be a good idea or maybe a bad idea for your buyer and then letting them decide. Um, the way we're going to fill this out today is if the buyer wants the inspection and wants the right to object and resolve with the seller. So very common for me, I put the termination deadline uh, the same day as the objection deadline, because let's face it, if you're going to object and submit a, a request, it's saying you want the house as long as these items are fixed or repaired in your, your best you know, interest, then the seller would have the option to decide whether or not they're going to um, do, those item, do those things or repairs or replacements that you requested and then if the buyer and seller are not able to come to a resolution, the contract would terminate anyways. So for me, I put the termination deadline and the objection deadline on the same day and then the resolution just a couple of days after. Inspections, uh, talk to your inspector, uh, but if you can't get a hold of your inspector, my rule of thumb is about a week and a half out for objection and then a couple of days after for resolution and same thing with termination. So 
inspector could probably get out there next week, give your buyer some time to review the report and maybe object on Tuesday. I'm sorry, not object or terminate by Tuesday or object by Tuesday. And then if we do an objection, we want to give the seller a few days. I do see some buyer's agents that will uh, put the resolution right after the objection. Uh, I'm all about psychology with this game. Uh, pushing a seller and pushing a seller's agent. One, you don't know what their what their day-to-day -day looks like. The seller may have a very long, busy work day. The agent might have a very long, busy work day. So I tend to give them at least two days uh, for resolution. Again, up to you and your tactics. Property insurance termination deadline. This should be done uh, within the first week, week and a half. So again, keeping things in the same even keel, making sure that your mind is right around dates and deadlines. I like to keep this date as the exact same date as the termination and objection for inspection. Due diligence doc documents. So due diligence documents are documents that the, the seller has or, or knowledge of the property that they need to disclose um, outside of the seller's property disclosure. So such thing as uh, appliance manuals, um, major uh, repair receipts, invoices, um, any sort of like roof replacement, sewer line replacement, any, any documentation that really pertains to the house that really needs to go and be transferred to the buyer is what due diligence documents are. So with that being said, most sellers, you know, and sellers agents are telling their sellers, gather this information up before we list the property. So this shouldn't be something that takes too long to get over to your buyer. Um, again, I kind of like to keep a lot of my dates on the same deadline. So I'm going to go back up here to the uh, seller's property disclosure, lead-based paint disclosure. Since those are kind of disclosures or documents, uh, part of due diligence, in my opinion, I'm going to put the same date there uh, for delivery. Now, some, sometimes houses will have, uh, you know, a couple hundred pages of due diligence documents, and sometimes uh, contracts will have uh, nothing. Um, so I, if, there's, if there's a ton of documents, I definitely want to give my, my buyer some time. So give them a few days, and we'll probably go ahead and go over to that next Tuesday. And then again, if there's anything to object to and resolve, give the seller a couple of days to review your request and resolve um, in a manner in one or two business days. Conditional sale deadline. So this deadline is for any buyer that you have that needs to sell their current home first in order to close and commence on this property. So uh, depending, you will leave this blank if your buyer does not have a property they have to sell in order to buy, but you will have to put this deadline in if they have a property to sell. If they have a property to sell and you don't put this deadline in, um, your buyer and their earnest money will be in very big jeopardy if your contingent property does not sell in time. Um, the date that you want to put in here is going to be kind of situational specific. Um, sometimes the seller won't want you to have this conditional sale deadline out too far. Other times they'll give you adequate amount of time. In, in my world, if, if this is the contract we're writing today, and I have a, a buyer who needs to sell their house, I need to think and I need to work backwards, okay? If it's a 35-day or 45-day close and it takes you know a couple of weekends on the market to go under contract, this conditional sale deadline may be 60 days out. And if the conditional sale deadline is 60 days out, then the closing date and possession date are 60 days out because you will not be able to close on the buy side until the sell side's close. So the conditional sale deadline 100% has to be on or before the closing date. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to pretend like we have a buyer who needs to sell their house. It's not on the market yet. Um, and we're going to give them one to two weekends to then uh, go under contract. So if today is the 21st, we will go through this weekend and then possibly give them till the next weekend and then maybe go under contract maybe around the 31st into the first. I kind of like to play it safe and let's just look at the first for easy math. Then we go under contract. That's about a 30 to 35 day close. So all the way through February into March 4th would be about the 30, 31 day mark. And then um, you know, anything after that, you might want to put in some buffer days. So for me, I'd probably put in something like the 9th or the 10th and then uh, hope everything falls into place. We go under contract on their sell side and both parties can close on the 10th.
If there is a lead, if there is a property that you're right, uh, working on a contract for that's built between, before 1978, um, this is the termination deadline. So this is the delivery deadline for the disclosure. And then this would be the deadline for the buyer to terminate. Sometimes you'll see agents that will use maybe a day or so after the deadline to deliver. I use it on the same day and I just prep my buyers, right? If you have a buyer who's looking at houses before 1978, you really need to educate them on that. So that way, if the property is built, then the seller delivers it to you. You guys will know whether you're going to terminate uh, due to lead-based paint disclosure or not. So I, keep, I commonly force my buyer to put it on the same day so they can make a decision quickly and everybody can get on with their, with their contract or termination. All right, so closing date and possession date and time. We put on there that we do have a house to sell. Uh, we're looking at a closing date tentatively of, this, of the conditional sale for 310. Again, if you have a property that you need to sell first, the closing date has to be on or after the conditional sale deadline. So we'll go ahead and put that on the same date. And possession date, the same time. Some of this stuff can be negotiated, right? If there's a seller's uh, post-occupancy agreement, sometimes the seller will say, look, I'm cool to close on this date, but I'm going to need some time to get out of the house. And they might want a week or so. Uh, but for the sake of this video, we're going to close and take possession the same day and time. And for possession time, uh, just because there's no set time for the closing to commence with the title company, you know, we're 30, we're almost 60 days out. Uh, we don't know exactly what time. And so... For time for me, I just put upon delivery of deed and that kind of covers all basis there. Your acceptance deadline. This is uh, pretty important to understand and, and, under, and know. This says acceptance deadline. This does not say response deadline. Let me say that again, because I can say this 10 times and you still will get caught up in the moment, right? You submit this offer, you put an acceptance deadline of, of Monday at 9 a.m. and you don't hear anything back. That's okay, you guys. It's not a response deadline. Make sure your buyers understand that because they get really upset if you say, hey, you know, the seller has until Monday at 9 a.m. to look at this. And all of a sudden it's noon on Monday and you haven't heard a word back. Now your buyer's frustrated because you didn't, you didn't explain this to them and you didn't educate them. It's an acceptance deadline. If they want to accept the contract as is, then yes, they need to do it before Monday at 9 a.m. So if you don't receive anything back as far as an executed contract goes before Monday at 9 a.m., that's okay. It doesn't mean your offer is still not in play. They can still counter you. The reason why this offer is still in play, even Monday after 9 a.m., is because a counterproposal needs to be signed by both parties, the seller and the buyer. So once the counterproposal has been sent and the buyer agrees and signs, it is an executed contract, and that can be done after the acceptance deadline because it's just simply for the seller accepting all terms as is. Any questions about that? Call me, call your managing broker, or any of the coaches. All right. Just so going right along here. This is another big note to, to, to pay attention to. It's one of those kind of um, head scratchers in real estate. We have our loan deadlines up here. Okay. But if the contract or if your buyer has a VA or FHA loan, you will still need to put these dates in. Okay. Even after I show you what the contract says, still put these dates in. And the reason for that is because once you put these dates in, that means that these sections or these paragraphs apply. If you don't put these dates in, you're saying that these don't apply. Down here, what it says is that the VA or FHA loan boxes are checked the appraisal does not apply to VA or FHA insured loans. So you still need the dates in for appraisal. You still need the dates in for the loan. It's just saying that the FHA or VA is not, maybe or maybe not going to hit those deadlines, but you still need those paragraphs to apply for your buyer's rights. Any questions about that? Please reach out. Um, section 
332 and 333. So this is new. This used to be in section 18, I believe, but for 2022, it's in section three. Um, this basically will, you need to, you need to state whether you will or will not proceed to the next business day if it falls on a weekend or a holiday. Um, my contracts, I commonly proceed to the next business day, just in case I accidentally put any of these dates on a weekend or holiday. I just want to cover my butt and make sure that um, we got a business date to execute whatever's needed. Now, section four, purchase price and terms. So very common box that's, 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 that I see errors on whenever I review contracts. So please pay attention closely. Don't be that person that can't do math. No, I kid. If you're, if you're just starting off, you are going to mess this up. That's why you send it to your coaches for review. Um, but the rule of thumb is, is you want to make sure that all of this stuff adds up to the total. If this stuff does not add up to the total, something's off. So let's do an example here. All right. We'll do a very easy, very, very concise example. Purchase price or the offer price is 500000 All right. Earnest money was ten thousand. Now you're going to be doing let's let's call it a twenty percent down payment. So twenty percent of five hundred thousand is one hundred thousand dollars down. So this is asking you for your loan amount. Your loan amount very important here. Do not put a hundred thousand. That's not the loan amount. That's the down payment. You're going to put four hundred thousand dollars down. That's the loan amount. Now, I use CTM, so it's going to automatically populate my cash to closing. So I just said there was $100,000 down. So it changed it to 90, 90,000. That's because, like I said, you need to add all of this column up to make this. 10,000 plus 400,000 plus 90,000 equals the 500,000. This is the mistake I see over and over and over again. Somebody will put in here 100000 because they believe that that, it, see, my system won't even let me make that error. They believe that the down payment is 100000 and that 100000 is going to be the cash closing, and they completely forget that $10,000 is submitted as far as earnest money goes. Beating this like a dead horse because I, I just see this all the time. Make sure that this column adds up, and if this column adds up, you should have a total here that matches this total. Any questions? Call your coaches. Seller concession. Um, in the seller's market, we're not seeing too much of a seller's concession. Um, so a lot of times I'm putting in zero right now. But let's explain this for a second. A seller concession is basically a dollar amount that you can ask the seller to provide the, to the buyer um, to help out with their closing costs and prepaid items. Very, very, very important to note here. A seller concession amount cannot, should not be more than the buyer's closing costs and prepaid items on the loan. So if the buyer's closing cost is $5,000 and you ask the seller for $6,000 and the seller agrees to that, what will happen at closing is, is the, the buyer is only going to actualize the 5,000. It doesn't have an automatic price reduction of 1,000. The buyer is just completely out of that money. So if you're asking for seller concession and you're working with the buyer, make sure you do not put in a dollar amount in this section larger than their closing costs and prepaid items. Well, Bruce, how, how the heck do you know how much the seller can use? Again, you guys, communication, 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 communication. I bet you it's probably no joke, 10 to 20 times a week. Um, uh, people will ask me questions and uh, about 10 to 20 times a week, my response is, is that's a great question. Did you ask X, Y, and Z? Okay, this world, we need to communicate more than we ever thought possible. So to figure out what the max seller concession is, you can simply call the lender and work that through with them. Earnest money amount. So earnest money, uh, this is, um, uh, you know, what the buyer is going to submit uh, once the contract is executed to the title company to kind of uh, hold their spot or put earnest on the line. So earnest money uh, commonly is found in the MLS um, as far as the dollar amount that the seller is looking for. Now, it is negotiable. 
And so let's do a real world example here. Let's see if we can't go over to the MLS here. Let's find a property and I'll show you in Iris where the earnest money amount is. So if you open up the, um, if you open up the MLS report, scroll all the way down and right here, it says minimum earnest money amount is 10,000. Now the what like how it says this is the minimum amount, and that minimum amount, like I said, it it it, it looks like it's like non-negotiable right here. Minimum amount. If your buyer only has five thousand dollars to put on there, and they're using some sort of down payment assistance loan, that's okay. Put five thousand dollars into the contract. Also, what you'll notice in the MLS here is where you will see the title company recipient, or I'm sorry, the earnest money recipient. Very, very commonly, earnest money recipient is going to be the title company for the contract. I just so happened to pull an MLS listing for a new build. And yes, some new build companies will have their own department to hold earnest money, but I would say um, almost 100% or I should say 99.9% .9 of all resale homes, your earnest money recipient will be some sort of title company. So copy and paste it, put it right into the contract. Let's jump back over. Um, earnest money amount held by and in the form of. So for me, in the form of good funds. Good funds. And I know we were just talking about amount. Amount is where you would change it up here. So if you didn't have five or 10,000, then you would just put in 5,000 up here and see what the seller says. If you buyer can, I would encourage you to match what the MLS says just because you're going to start yourself off on the right foot with negotiations with the selling side and the seller. Um, earnest money will be in the form of good funds. Really important to note, good funds um, kind of encompasses a cashier's check um, or a personal check. Now, it cannot be a cashier's check or a personal check from the buyer's business. So if the buyer's buying it in the buyer's name, then the check needs to be from the buyer's name. If they're buying it in a business, then the then the check needs to be from the business account. Um, if you do have any, you know, situations where the buyer, um, you know, can't figure out how to get earnest money from it, uh, into their name into the title company, um, work it out with the title company. See what acceptable form the title company would like to see, and uh, see if you can't get around it. This is where you put the title company. So I commonly use First American. And that's all you put in there. Uh, moving right along here. We're going to skip down to available funds, section 443. What you're going to say, what this is asking you is, does the buyer have the funds as listed as, as at the cat for cash at closing immediately verifiable? So the cash at closing funds that they're talking about, again, references section 4.1. So up here. This is the cash at closing section. Does your buyer have $90,000 in their account that is immediately verifiable and available for withdrawal? I say that very particularly because I, I watch a lot of people put does and that $90,000 is coming from the sale or conditional sale of another property. If the down payment money is coming from another property that has not been sold and closed yet, that money is not immediately verifiable because the, well, the, the house hasn't closed. So we don't know what's gonna, how it's going to close, what monies are going to come back. And so if they do have a house to sell, you're going to put does not. If they have the money in their bank account, put does. Another question that comes up is... Um, um, investment accounts, IRA accounts, stocks, bonds. I mean, um, those accounts are considered verifiable, but they're not for immediate withdrawal. Okay. And so some, in some cases, you're going to put does not if it's an investment account. In other cases, there's some investment accounts where it's, it's liquid, meaning they can transfer to their bank account in the next hour. That's immediately verifiable and liquid. So then you would put does. If there are any questions, let me know. Um, most commonly, a buyer has the money straight in their bank account. So just put does. If they don't have it in their bank account, put does not. Uh, new loan. 
new loan. This is where you're going to fill out this section here to, dis, uh, to decide what loan type they're using. You'll notice that these checkboxes are able to all be checked and it doesn't default to one or another. So if you have a buyer who might be getting pre-approved and they can't, they're going back and forth with interest rates and down payments and they, they don't necessarily know what the best loan would be for them. They're contemplating between FHA and conventional. Perfectly fine to select both. If you're going to select both, I would highly recommend that you communicate that to the seller as to why. Um, and the main reason being is that some sellers um, may or may not want an FHA loan on the property because of the condition. Sometimes there's missing, chipping, peeling paint, um, roof repair that needs to be done. You name it, sometimes a property will not be FHA eligible. And so when a seller sees that, they start to maybe go, is this the right buyer for us? Uh, but if you know exactly what loan it is, just click on the respective loan type and leave it be. Um, you don't have to select two, but you can. Um, again, if you have any sort of loan assumption, um, please reach out. You know, it doesn't happen very common as far, and as far as seller or private financing too. So I leave all of that section blank unless it applies. 95% of the time it does not. All right, I think... That's about it for section four and five. So we'll start video number three on section six.